chief counsel and staff director of the House Select Committee on Assassinations, please welcome Professor G. Robert Blakey. My written statement is up on the site for this conference. Uh, you all have access to it there. I'm not going to read it. I assume that you can read. And with the printing press, people reading statements to other people, uh, surely it was made obsolete. What I want to share with you are just some personal f reflections about what was going on at that time, that time being the, the Kennedy administration. I was a young attorney in the organized crime and racketeering section. And the day of the assassination, there was a meeting in the attorney general's office about organized crime. Uh, I was in that meeting. And then we broke for lunch, and of course, we never came back again. And while my memory could be wrong on this, I remember that I was talking to the Attorney General about Sam Giancana in Chicago, uh, where I was going to go uh, and become part of a prosecution team uh, in that city. Uh, we broke for lunch. And obviously, the assassination occurred. Uh, and I came back to the office. And I was standing next to a man named Henry Peterson, who was like a mentor to me in the department. He was an ex-Marine. Uh, and if you saw him with his shirt off, he looked like uh, Michelangelo's David. And hard like a rock as well. He was standing looking out the window, and he had tears streaming down his face. And I thought to console him by saying, well, we've lost the president, but we've gained a new president. There'll be continuity. And he says, I'm not crying because of Kennedy's death. I'm crying because Johnson's president. <laughs> and uh, that struck me at the time. And I had in my pocket. Uh, a ticket to go to Chicago, find the house to move there, sell the house in Washington. And frankly, I reconsidered the whole flight. Uh, if I had gone to Chicago to work in investigating organized crime and corruption in Chicago, and organized crime is responsible for corruption, and sometimes corruption is responsible for organized crime, the mayor was daily. And if I didn't have Robert Kennedy at my back with the president at his back, that program just would not last. And I knew that. And I said, why should I sell a house here and buy a house there if it's going to be six months or so? So I started looking for a teaching position, which I ultimately went. And that unit in Chicago lasted six months. Uh, Let me return, I think, to some times where you might want to think the whole thing about the assassination begins, and that's the Bay of Pigs. Uh, the president was very clearly told before he authorized that project that it had a high margin of success and that it would not be necessary to employ uh, American forces, naval, air, uh, or otherwise that the Cubans could do it on its own. Uh, the CIA, uh, Dulles, et cetera, Helms, all knew that that was a lie. But they expected that when the president was faced with the option of having it fail or intervening, he would, he would intervene. So basically, he was sucked into that program uh, by misinformation from the CIA. 
And that is an incident that needs to be put in the context of everything we do or, or deal with in, in the context of the agency. I came out of the investigation believing that the CIA had basically cooperated with the agents, with us, uh, and that we could rely at least on what they told us. Uh, I have since come to the belief that I was wrong. Uh, but let me kind of sort of tell you what, what happened from my perspective. I came in to the committee, and the committee was negotiating an agreement with the agency for, for getting documents, and I took over that negotiation. And one of the things is, who, who should get classified information? Should it be declassified before it's given to the committee? And I took the, I recognized if we had to fight over classification for a document, uh, the committee's life was not long enough to do that. So what I negotiated with them was that we would have people who were all had top secret security clearance. And therefore, it was not a declassification to give us a document. That we would look at the documents and decide later in negotiation with them, and if it failed, let a court decide it, whether this particular document should be declassified. Uh, and what we did, as best as we could, as we got closer and closer to the end of the life of the committee, we uh, had to negotiate the final report line by line. And what we did basically is agree with the agency that it wasn't always necessary to know how something was learned. The important significant fact was what was learned. And so as we edited the report, insofar as we could do it, we excluded references to sensitive sources and methods. And I thought perhaps the agency would disagree with some of what we did, but at least we made an effort to protect sensitive sources and methods. And in that context, we would have free flow of, of material between the agency and the committee. Uh, the agency was one of the suspects uh, in the case. There's no doubt about that. And at least two of the people who were our researchers at the agency had been students of mine at Cornell, and you've heard from them. Uh, they were, protect, were chosen to work on the agency because both of them passionately believed that the agency killed the president. And I figured if they went in with that bias, they would find in all the records that they got access to everything that would confirm what their judgments were. Uh, and they were, were aggressive people. And uh, the person who filtered much of that uh, was Scott. Is his last name Scott? His first name is Scott. Breckenridge. Who was a nice fellow. Uh, easy, you could sort of talk to him. And he thought that uh, Eddie and Danny were young, naive, and aggressive, and probably communist, <laughs> yeah. at least in, in Dan Eddie's part. Uh, I didn't necessarily disagree with that, uh, but it seems to me as a person who goes in who's naive will see more things than a person who's cynical. And if he's aggressive, what would you want, a passive researcher? Uh, so I was satisfied with what they did. They continued to complain, uh, and at one stage, Scott made the suggestion that we would bring in a facilitator who, who would be assigned to the committees. Everything that would be, would be asked for by the committee, uh, and that meant Dan or Eddie, as a practical matter, would be, he would facilitate finding it and making it available to him. And that seemed to me to be a good idea. And Dan and Eddie told me after that, is it's worse. It hasn't gotten better, it's worse. And we were getting close enough to the final report that uh, 
I paid less attention to them than I should have. And that's part of what uh, I want to talk to you about today. When the assassination goes down, it is the case that people who might be embarrassed by some of the investigation on both sides in the government, and this uh, focusing principally now on the C CIA, would tend to hide that. Uh, in particular, this is a one particular instance, we know that Lee Harvey Oswald had contact uh, with the DRE, that's Revolutionary Student Directed in Spanish, because it exploded in public. I mean, it was no question that he had it. There are other situations where Oswald is supposed to have contact with people, and there's a credibility problem, not whether people are lying, but whether their memory is good or not good, and you have to make judgments about what happens. There are people who say that Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby were together before the assassination. And I ultimately came to credit none of those reports. But putting that aside for a moment, uh, we needed to find out uh, what the DRE file said. And basically we asked for it and never got it. And we've only learned since that Joannides, incredibly, was the case agent for the DRE. Now, I can't remember specifically, but I'm sure I did. I asked whether there was a case agent and was told no by the man who was the case agent. Ironic. Ironic. Just, you know, it's wild. It's the sort of thing that you wouldn't believe. It, it takes uh, gonads to do a thing like that. <laughs> uh, I guess if I do it in Spanish, it's more acceptable publicly. Uh, so he was, he subsequently became the head of the disinformation program at the Miami uh, station. Uh, and then ultimately the person who was the filter through which. Now you can say if he was the filter and he wanted to exclude things, what did he exclude? I don't know. If I knew what he excluded, then it, they wouldn't be excluded. Uh, that's the sort of dilemma we're in. The fact that they put him in there, uh, did they put him in to exclude things? That's certainly one of the inferences. Uh, Scott de described him as a man who was knowledgeable. Yeah, about the DRE, but he didn't tell me anything about that. If I had known who he was, he would not have been the facilitator. He would have been a material witness under oath, if not taken by me, by one of the other senior counsel. And we would have found out that he was the person who was in charge of that. Um, the DRE, the financing your DRE was overwhelmingly from the agency. The problem was they were a little too independent and he was sent in as a person to clean this up. And we subsequently found out through the information, uh, FOIA, that uh, he described what work that he did for us as in an undercover capacity. Really? An undercover agent dealing with uh, a congressional committee? Uh, I'm surprised they used the word. And we've been tried to find out through the Freedom of Information. I'm a co-plaintiff with Jeff Morley. You've probably heard from him or will hear from him later, who's been the spearhead for, for all of this. I've signed a bunch of affidavits and discussed the legal strategy, uh, et cetera. And the District of Columbia is no venue to argue about CIA matters and disclosure and the FOIA. The presumption in the court, at least the ones we've had, is that you're just crazy and we're not going to bother anybody about it. We've incredibly got some of what he did reversed. But we wanted to find out what undercover meant 
And that's part of what the agency has now still held out. Remember, the Warren Commission was, was to get full cooperation. It was never tell, told about the CIA mafia plots. Uh, and I interviewed the, the staff director and said, had you known this, would you have done things differently? And he said, of course. That's a conspiracy lead. We were denied it. I mean, the Warren Commission was denied it. Uh, the Warren Commission was denied access to the transcripts of recorded conversations by the major figures of organized crime. I mean the mob, the Cosa Nostra Mafia, whatever you want to call it. After Kennedy came in and found out basically the FBI didn't know anything about organized crime, he told them to get off their derriere and go out and get some evidence. And what the Bureau did is they shifted people who previously was doing security work, listening to phones and bugging the Communist Party, to look at uh, the mob. And they did. Uh, and nobody told the Warren Commission about that. And in those transcripts are discussions, among other things, of should we shoot Kennedy? Or should we shoot the Attorney General? Or should we shoot Hoover? And people were talking about this regularly. So here you have a group uh, that has the motive, opportunity, and means for assassination. My reaction was that, and my experience had been in organized crime investigations, is the mob would never do it. It was too high a risk venture. And that ironically, here's the word again, ironically, I could prove they were innocent. I have been trying to put those people in jail for years. And subsequently, uh, uh, that I would go out to prove they were innocent. And instantly, this is an investigative hypothesis. I could have framed it in terms of whether they're guilty and then see what the transcripts show. I thought they would exculpate them. And if they were exculpated, we could eliminate somebody. Well, uh, as Don Thomas puts it, I had, Blakey had another problem. It didn't exculpate them. But it didn't really inculpate them either. I assumed that the coverage of, of, the, of the mob was complete. It was virtually absent in New Orleans. The agent down there was a man named Kennedy no relationship, and he came, sat in my office, and told me to my face that Carlos Marcello was not a member of the mob or anything like it, uh, that he was just a tomato salesman. Oh. And when he came in the office, the liaison with the FBI sat next to him, and he literally fell out of his chair when he said that and came back later and apologized to me for it. I don't have hard evidence, but I think that um, he may have been compromised with Marcello. I don't know that for, for a fact. I do know that after he was transferred or retired, I don't know which, a guy named P uh, Pat Collins came down there. And he got a bug in uh, on Marcello within a matter of days, weeks. So it was not impossible to get coverage of Carlos Marcello. And they weren't even doing it legally, illegally. They were doing it illegally, and Pat was doing it legally with all the paperwork and probable cause and things like that. So the absence of surveillance of Carlos Marcello meant that you couldn't preclude. You couldn't inculpate, but you couldn't exculpate based on the surveillance. In Chicago, for, for example, I do not believe that Giancana had anything to do with the assassination. And the reason I believe that is the electronic surveillance the coverage that they had on him. They had him in his weekly meetings in the Armory Lounge. Uh, they had him in his weekly meetings uh, at Ju Gus Alex Taylor's shop. I mean, they had coverage of him. Uh, and he admitted involvement in all sorts of corruption, criminal behavior, including homicide. But he's had very few remarks about the Kennedy assassination and no contact 
with Ruby through the surveillance logs and only comments about Oswald afterwards and nothing to indicate that he had any connection to him. I think Giancana gets a pass. And Giancana was the guy that I was talking to Kennedy about beforehand. I am predisposed to find that Sam Giancana is what he was, uh, the head of the mob in Chicago. But the surveillance, if the surveillance exculpates him, it exculpates him. So be it. It's whatever the evidence is. Uh, despite the fact that some people think that I went in with a bias uh, in the investigation, I didn't. I talked to the chairman beforehand and said, look, my understanding is that the Warren Commission was honest, did a fair job, I read the report, um, I think they're probably right. Uh, and if anybody thinks the mob did it, they don't know anything about the mob. Uh, I was wrong on both those things. And I now admit a change of position. Uh, let me give you an example of one of the changes of positions for me. Uh, were there two shooters in the plaza? Apart from, forget, forget the appendix, I mean, I mean the acoustics. What did the witness say at the time? The Warren Commission did not review the testimony of the witnesses and did not individually assess their credibility, telling me why they didn't, couldn't have said what they did because they were in the wrong place, blah, 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 all the things you do. Is this guy telling the truth? Well, was he in a position where he could have observed it? Does he have any motive to lie uh, one way or the other? Nothing like that was done. In fact, what it said is there's no, this is quote, no credible evidence of more than shots from the, from the depository. Well, let me review for you some of the witnesses who said there were two shooters. How about Chief Carey in the lead car? How about Special Agent, this is Secret Service, Farrar Charles in the lead car? Paul Lan Secret Service agents Paul Lannitz in a car behind? Uh, Dave Powers? There are at least two couples on the uh, Rassy Knoll who say that there were two shots. And by two shots, I mean shots from this direction and shots from that direction. Confirm the uh, Rassy Knoll shot. There is what I, I call the perfect witness, a man named S.M. Holland. He was standing on the railroad overpass, and so he looked down on the assassination. He said there were four shots, three from the depository, one from the Grassy Knoll area, and he said he saw a puff of smoke over there. A lot of people say, well, he wasn't using a blunderbuss, so we don't have smoke anymore. It depends on how clean your gun is. If your gun is not clean, it will smoke. Go to any police firing range, and that blue haze is smoke. So guns do make smoke. Uh, he said the first shot missed, the second shot hit, apparently Governor Kennedy and Conley, and then there was a space of time, and suddenly there were two quick shots, one from the grassy knoll and then one from the depository that hit him in the head. That testimony, which the Warren Commission made every effort to undermine, and he hung in there all the way through. Without the benefit of acoustics, without the benefit of an analysis of the Zabruder film, without any ballistics, uh, without any forensics in the uh, uh, looking at Kennedy's body, that man had it right. Absolutely had it right. In addition, and I don't understand Texans, they, like the police officers who ran up against the grocery no. That's where the shot came from. Why are you running where the shot came from? He went around the other side of the fence to do what? To c c confront somebody with a gun who had just shot the president? That's why I don't understand Texans, but he did. And he found that because the, there had been light rain in the morning that the ground was still uh, damp. 
and there was evidence that somebody had been standing behind the fence because you could see the, the tracks in the mud and that they'd even cleaned their shoes on the uh, bumpers of the cars right next to it. The other end, uh, there is a police officer coming up with his gun open. Well, he said he don't know why he pulled his gun. I know why he pulled his gun, because he was going to go face somebody with a gun. But he said he didn't know why he had done that, but that he met coming out from behind the fence, two men, and one of them showed him uh, Secret Service credentials, so he waved them through. There are people in the plaza who remember smoke, the smell of smoke. Is none of that credible evidence that there was a shot behind the grassy knoll? I ask you, that sounds to me like the kind of evidence I would hope for. Uh, police officers in a place to observe what they observed, testifying in unison on, on this. So I kind of lost confidence in the Warren Commission report on that, that one line. It's not a report of an investigation of the assassination. It's a justification for the conclusion Lee Harvey Oswald did it alone. And everything in the Warren Commission uh, report reflects that. And you have to know. Uh, let me, for example, the Warren Commission wanted to say that Jack Ruby had no mob connections. So that one of the FBI agents interviewed a man named Lenny Patrick, who grew up in the neighborhood uh, that Ruby grew up. Uh, and Lenny Patrick told him, oh, no, Ruby had no connections to the, to the mob. Do you, does anybody here know who Lenny Patrick is? Mafioso. Yes, he's a shooter for the mob. <laughs> so they went out and got a shooter. For, and the story is, I don't know what's entirely true, is when Giancana was trying to take over the black numbers routes and other gambling activity in the city, that uh, there was a man named Zuki the Bookie, and R Ruby worked for Zuki the Bookie, and he got killed, not Ruby, but Z Zuki the Bookie, and Lenny Patrick went to Ruby and said, get out of town. And that was the occasion for uh, Ruby moving to Dallas. This is the man who's exculping Ruby for mob connections? It, it's somebody who said he had none, and therefore it's a footnote. But the footnote has no credibility, uh, none at all. So now, what am I going to do? Well, we've since found out that Joe Anides uh, was CIA, and CIA DRE, and that he lied to us. And the agency basically set up a situation where they could edit what we got. And why would they edit what we got? Uh, cover up their incompetence, cover up their complicity, cover up with their foreknowledge? Uh, I don't know, because I don't know what they covered up. And that's what's now being the last trail of documents now held in the agency that won't be declassified until, I think, what is it, 1975 or 2070 or some, sometime? Uh, how much time have I got? Okay. Uh, I come away with, now, uh, there's an old rule in the law that if a person lies to you on one thing, uh, that's a justification that you can say he lies on everything. So my position about the agency is they didn't cooperate with us. They affirmatively made an effort not to cooperate with us, and therefore everything that they told us is a lie. Uh, and all of the statements in the report about cooperation is just false. We were had. Now, who were the other people that were had? The Pike Committee was had. The Warren Commission was had. The House Select Committee, the Church Committee was had. The Select Committee on Assassination was had. The, the, the AARB, they didn't tell them the truth about Joe and Aides. So every agency that's made an effort to hold the CIA 
uh, accountable for what they did or didn't do, judge their efficiency or lack of it, has been uh, frustrated by the agency. I've decided that they are a culture of dissimulation who has now gotten to the point where they don't know the difference between black and white. And when they tell you something, it's because it serves a purpose. They don't tell you the truth. They serve whatever serves their purpose. And until you find out what the purpose is, you can't can trust them, which raises a terrible problem in a free society. They serve us. And as bad as the Congress is bad, and I've served both in the House and the Senate, they are largely nimcompoots uh, who are only worried about their reelection. But there's a hard core of people in the Senate and in the House, and even today, I think, who are on the merits and are serving us well. They are a reflection of us. The House and the Senate is a reflection of us. We get as good a Congress as we elect. And we elect some, some good people and some people who shouldn't be there. Uh, I don't know how they institutionally can check the CIA. I didn't. Uh, and I did everything I could to see that we could do it. I see I have about four or five minutes left. Sure. I think I really should give, since I have, my responsibility is larger than my talk, uh, if there are people who want to ask me a question. Uh, Dr. Newman? About anything. Dr. John uh, Newman. Please do so. Dr. Please, thank you for coming and sharing uh, that history with us. I have just one question. Um, I wonder if you, are you probably aware of the Joe and Edie's part two to the Esther Lyme memo I shared with Dan and Eddie that he might have also been a case officer involved in the uh, Cabela assassination plot? And what would your reaction to that be? It's worse, makes it worse. Of course, I don't know how it could be worse. Is, is, what is the thing you say? Is worse, worse, and worse? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it, it takes it off beyond worser. He was in charge of disinformation in Miami. We got it in the foyer. Yeah, well, good. I don't know how it slipped by. Go ahead. And I also, Jerry Polikoff from New okay. York, and I want to thank you for <laughs> being here as well. But you just, um, the case you just made for a shot from the grassy you know, uh, and the credible evidence that supported it, I'm very grateful that you did that. The commission, or, or the HSCA also, though, even in spite of the acoustics, determined that Lee Harvey Oswald fired all the shots that hit Kennedy. And what I want to ask you, it, very similar to the credible evidence that there were shots from the knoll, Lee Harvey Oswald said he didn't shoot the president. He said it was downstairs. There were people on the stairs that should have encountered him when he came down that didn't. He was seen very shortly after the assassination in the second Room, lunchroom by Roy Truly and by uh, Officer Baker. Uh, he described people he saw in the lunchroom when he was down there who didn't see him, but they were there. There are at least six people that put him down there. And the only person that put him upstairs was Charles Givens, who originally said he was downstairs and then changed his testimony and then said he went upstairs to get his cigarettes and there was Oswald. But we also have a document from Officer Revel that says that Charles Givens has been previously arrested on a marijuana charge. That and doesn't would, necessarily... All right, but, but I just... I'm, I'm just I, I, this is a long question, but it's a question. Yes, it is. Okay. We have five okay. minutes, gentlemen. The, well, okay. you know, what I'm... I, my question Wrap is... My question, question is, is, would you concede that there is credible evidence that even if the shots came from the sixth floor, that Oswald didn't fire them and, you know, make the same concession? Yes. Okay. What I would say is if I were defense counsel for Oswald, I would have a case that I could put in. But I will tell you, as a defense counsel for Oswald, I would think I was going to lose. And if it had been a different Kennedy, mm -hmm. nobody would have worried about the conviction or whether the evidence was sufficient. He'd be in jail somewhere languishing for forever. Forever. Mm -hmm. The Ed, problem with this case is we know too much about it. Ed Lopez. So, Bob, 
Hey, so first of all, no gotchas from me, Bob. Um, <laughs> great to see I'm you. I'm not going to tell you that you were wrong and I was right. Okay, okay great. <laughs> so, so it's great to see you, hear you, and um, I'm looking so forward to catching up with you later. And we really missed you yesterday on our panel because, as you know, we were going to do a panel with a view from the top and the view from the trenches. And um, it would have been great to have had a back and forth um, discussion. I did want to um, respond, though, to a question that you posed uh, at the beginning of your presentation about the use of the word undercover for Joannides. And um, to me, it's not really that strange of a word, because what happened is that we had been getting access to all the documents. And all of a sudden, this guy is brought in, and the whole process changes. First, only six of us can go into a special room. Second, we all need to have a special security clearance. Others can't go in there. Third, we're, they're controlling what we get and what we don't get in a very different way than before when we were getting access to whatever we asked for. Fourth, now we were getting copies that were expurgated before they were unexpurgated. Fifth, we started asking for people back then, we would get access to them. All of a sudden with him, we didn't have access to them. So to me, whether it was him, or Scott Breckenridge, or the two of them together, now controlling our investigation, Thanks. it was, to me, an undercover operation. Okay. So, so I had to make I'll, that. Well, I'll buy that yeah. use of the word. Right. I just say that you shouldn't have that kind of an operation to Agreed. limit a congressional committee's access. No, so agree, but, but that's, that's, I just wanted to mention that. The other thing is that um, I know we were very naive, and then I will admit that we were incredibly naive, but these two naive guys did say to Bob and Gary at one point that the CIA would only make available what they thought was going to be useful to them in how they wanted the investigation to go. And, um, you know, out of the mouth of babes sometimes come <laughs> strong words. Well said. <laughs> Dr. Mantic. David Mantic from uh, Jerry Ford's hometown. Uh, oh, simple please. yes or no question. Is the magic bullet theory true? Yes. Wow. Pat Spear. <clears throat> well, I'll try to give you some of that. Like some, some, I'll we got two minutes. Um, I take it you disagree be, with what I yeah, just said. Yeah. Be, well, beyond, he's in a stupor. That's why. Be, beyond the, uh, just shocked me. Beyond uh, the CIA's um, introduction of joint EDs into the, your investigation, there was another problem with the CIA in that a uh, CIA agent, Regis Blayhut, I think his name was, took a look at the autopsy photos. Yes. And in light of what you know now, now know about Joannides, do you no longer think that was innocent? No, I think he was just stupid. Quickly, please. Uh, Professor, thank you for your talk. Brian Bender with the Boston Globe. Two quick questions do that I think, how about one? Quick wait, wait, answers. Wait, do we let loose people in here? Uh, how did this, well, he's not really a newspaper guy. Okay. I, All right. just, I mean, come on. Okay. All right. He just has press credentials. It's okay. Um, if you were me, or you were the Boston Globe, what single document or set of documents would you file a lawsuit for? We have filed a lawsuit. And what you should do is talk to... Maybe I should address that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I represent Professor Blakey, uh, Eddie Lopez, and Dan Hardway, and my organization, the AARC, in two FOIA requests that have been submitted to the CIA. One is very short and simple. The other is comprehensive. It has 56 items of the request. We go after all of the documents that would relate to undercover operations against Blakey and Lopez and Hardway. Hardway and all records that relate to, uh, to uh, uh, David Phillips and, uh, and Joe Anides and David Morales. It's a, an omnibus request. But we're trying to first, we, we tested through a very short and simple request. The possibility that we can do this successfully is made possible because there is an exception to the CIA Information Act of, 1990, of 1984, 
which specified three categories of documents that would, would not be exempt from, the require, from a search uh, and review under the FOIA. Jeff Morley met one of those uh, categories, the most difficult one, when he filed his suit for the Joannides records. Our suit. But right. the but the right. the the um, the requests that have now been filed are made on behalf of of uh, Professor Blakey and Hard, uh, 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 Hardway and Lopez, and as American citizens, they are entitled to see the operational files on them. So I would the, think so. Pardon? I say I would think so. Yes. Right. Anybody so, here disagree with that proposition? <laughs> so it's, it's by statute. It's provi provided in the statute that American citizens can get the operational files on themselves. So we will potentially, with it, they're going to be roadblocks. The CIA will fight to the bitter end over this. There's no doubt about that. Last question. But, Last question. Okay, quickly. If, if you believe the mob did not just kill minute. Kennedy, it'll be a no. I believe they did, but well, not the mob whole, the whole mob, at the national commission level. No, I believe it was the conspiracy involving at least Marcello and Traficante. Okay. What, what do you make of the increasing number of calls and frequent calls that Ruby is making in the months just prior to this? We made a detailed analysis of it. It's open to two or three interpretations. Okay, can you tell us what the three? Well, the interpretation is that he was, had a tax problem, he needed to pay money, he was looking for money, and these calls were all to people who could facilitate his, mm -hmm. a couple of things, to get money or to get the union off his back. Union was mob dominated. Mm -hmm. So they're susceptible to that, but some of them uh, look like they're troublesome. The main reason I think they're not incriminating in the assassination is I don't think Ruby was brought in to the process until after Oswald was arrested. So Ruby is not a pre-assassination -assass pre associate. He's post. Let's thank Professor G. Robert Blakey for being with us.